you have a prepaid call from an inmate at the California Institution for Women, Corona, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using. So what do you go by? I go by, my name is former Lynn Phillips, and, but I go by Bobby. That was a uh, nickname from the baby. What's your nationality? My nationality is African American. Were you ever part of any gangs, groups, organization, or an associate? Um, I would be probably considered an associate because, um, of course, growing up with people in my neighborhood, I looked at them as family. So people that are in gangs refer to each other as family. So yeah, I was an associate. Okay, were you able to name um, specifically what groups or gangs that you were uh, associated with? No, because um, I, I associated with both Bloods and Crips, so both. And that's rare, but I did because these are family members. Okay, where are you from out here in the streets? Um, from South Central LA, over there off of Manchester and Central and Los Angeles. What are you incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? I am incarcerated for felony murder conviction and my sentence right now is life without possibility of parole. And how long have you been incarcerated? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I have been incarcerated for 24 years. And where are you currently incarcerated at? I am incarcerated at California Institution for Women in Corona. Okay, um, the next question I have for you is, um, can you elaborate, of course, without incriminating yourself and others? Because I don't know if you're going through uh, appeals or you're exhausted yet or things of that nature. Um, of the events that occurred that land you in prison, and also do you believe that you got a fair trial and a fair sentence considering the role you played in the crime? Well, I was convicted for a, my victim was a man and he was, the conviction, the underlying um, felony was kidnapped and he was murdered. So that, that's why it's felony murder. And it was, um, I was told I was like a principal because my property was stolen and I wanted to buy my property back and swash it, but things got escalated, and I, although I was not there and did not physically participate, I was still considered a part of the crime. Now, was it fair? Um, I don't know as far as fair for the victim. Yeah, we should have been um, arrested. We should have been addressed. Now, was the sentencing done um, procedurally correct? No, but um, I, I feel it was fair. Okay, um, I know the DA, the district attorney, has a certain narrative in your case, um, and I know how the DA uh, uh, gets down to demonize the individual. So right. my question is, what is the DA's narrative when you're going through trial? And also, what is your narrative? Okay, their narrative, as how they stereotype African Americans, is that I was an angry black woman. And angry because my property was stolen and um, I basically incited this person to be murdered. My narrative is I was a single mother of three. I was pregnant at the time. I had already lost a lot. I was involved in a uh, domestic violent relationship, and I was upset, but it was a combination of things, a combination of stress, and trying to get away from my abuser. That's my narrative. So I, I, I don't blame anybody, but it was still my choice, but I never, I know I never meant for anyone to be murdered. So. Okay, let me ask you this. Um... You probably took a trial and lost, right? That's why you got LWAP. 
versus a deal. Um, so is that correct? Yeah, but I was never offered a deal. It went from death penalty to only life without parole. I didn't have any lesser included charges. They gave me one charge, and that's what they convicted me of. It took 45 minutes. Okay, um, when you first went to prison and um, knowing that you got life without parole, um, how did you feel about it when you went to prison? Like, you know, can you go through, elaborate through your feelings? Like, you know, like, I'm never going to get out of here. And, you know, what, 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 what do you feel about it? Like, like what in general? Well, I, I was very angry. Like my first two or three years, I was angry. And I was trying to fight it, you know, but Riverside and their influence, they really influence a lot of um, attorneys to work against me. So the appointed attorney, even though he was a great attorney, but he was really working against my best interests. So it, it's like I never had a, a fight in the game. You know, whatever this is, I never had a fight. I never had a defense. So um, I was angry. And I was just determined to learn about this law, which today I'm a paralegal. So, and today I help many, many other people. So, yeah, I was angry. I'm gathering that um, this is bad counsel. And my question to you is, um, how is it bad counsel? Well, I had ineffective assistance from counsel from the very beginning, from the time I was arrested until the time I was convicted. I had ineffective assistance of counsel. And then, as I said, the appeal counsel, he didn't even bring up the constitutional grounds that he should have brought up. So it basically ate up my um, AEBPA, which is your, your time constraint. So it all, it screwed me. They screwed me, and I, and I get it, you know. They, they, somebody died and their, their job was to put me away forever, but they really didn't look at the human aspect of it. They didn't think about that I had two brothers murdered. You know, they, they didn't know none of my um, mitigating factors, none of it. So it's like, where do we go from here? Okay, I read briefly about the case and what I'm gathering is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or elaborate on a little bit further on it. Um, that it was pretty much at the wrong place at the wrong time or mistaken identity. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, would you able to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, when I say, when I say wrong place at the wrong time, I, I relocated from Los Angeles. I was a, a LVN. I was a nurse. And I relocated to Riverside, hoping to um, give my children a, a better environment. And I pulled this, gen this guy, my co-defendant, their house out of foreclosure. I, I found another job. I was working at a, a nice hospital, you know, and then they was going to give me an opportunity to become a registered nurse. So I had a lot to look forward to. And um, this gentleman, in his mind, I was going to pay his bills. To this day, I believe they had um, other nefarious intentions toward me because the brake lines actually got cut on the car that he made me drive. So it's like different things. But, it, you know, so that it wrong person, wrong place, wrong everything. But my intentions were pure. And I look back at it. Do I regret it? No. Am I a little bit more cautious now when I'm interacting with people? Yes. <laughs> Most definitely. Okay, um, did they have informants? Did this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Did they have informants, for example, uh, did your co-defendants and, 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 and things of that nature uh, told on you, and also did they have witnesses? Well, the, wit the witnesses were um, actually kind of part of the crime, and uh, one, in fact, was his brother, so, I, you know, I understand his, his brother was murdered, so I understand so, and initially everybody did say I didn't do anything, but the police were, and detectives, everybody was determined to hold me accountable. I don't know if they was trying to label it like a body and crime situation, but it never was that. It never was. Okay. But that's basically how they handled it. 
Okay, um, are you going through any type of appeals or is it exhausted yet? And if, and, and, and if it's exhausted, um, what measures are you taking to fight, to fight that? Well, I am currently in appeal, and I'm in appeal for the um, aider and better to be to um, look at this, my individual culpability, which is, that's all I ask. Look at my individual culpability. And um, that's what I'm fighting right now. And, oh, and then my other fight is that it's discrimination because my jury, I had 11 white people, one black people, so I think it's it's just discrimination across the board, you know. And then I um, encountered another female who had my same exact charges, and she got released within seven years. She came with an LWAP. She went home last year. In 2013, she had an LWAP. 2020, she went home. Time served. So and she was white. So um, I'm thinking discrimination. That's what I'm pursuing. Do you face any challenges or any altercations and, and things of that nature while you are uh, in prison? Well, the hardest thing was being separated from my children, being a mother that breastfed her first three children, so having that baby taken from me, being lied to and given a, um, a C-section, which I did not even need. So it was like, and then they was telling me CPS was going to pick up my kids, CPS going to get involved. Thank God my mother, she raised my children. But, you know, that was that was extremely hard. And it, just the um, emotional distress of seeing my children suffer and my mother suffer, you know. That as far as um, prison, I know who I am when I got to prison, so I never really got caught up in the mix. I don't do the girlfriends. I don't do the drugs. You know, I did not get in the mix. I stayed in church and I stayed in the law library. What do you have to say to the youth out here that's involved in gang activity or criminal activity or thinking about joining gangs? Um, the one thing that I would like to encourage young people, because again, I have children who are adults, I have nieces, nephews. I just had a nephew murdered last year. So I know that it's not a video game that we shoot people, no, they don't come back. Um, just be careful of your friends. And I know that you, they're your friends and they want you to be loyal to them, but you got to think about the sacrifice. What are you willing to give up? Are you willing to give up the rest of your life to sit in prison for love or for... Um, somebody eventually that don't care about you, because trust me, the only few people that are sticking by my side is my family or other um, compassionate individuals who have come in my life that are positive people. So, you know, gains is not worth it. Um, the mentality of a gang member is not worth it. You know, so I say seek to be positive be around like-minded people, pursue healthy goals for your life. And by healthy goals, I mean mind, body, and soul to be healthy, to eat healthy, to exercise, to get your education. That is the most important thing, get your education and, um, and be respectful towards your fellow mankind. You know, I don't care what race, I don't care what um, gender, just be respectful. That's it. Okay, I don't have any more questions for you, but do you have anything else to address or add? Pardon me? Um, I don't do have I have an address? No, I don't have any more questions for you, but do you have anything else to address or add? We have 60 seconds remaining. Well, basically what I want to add is that people who are on parole, they people who are out there and thinking their vote don't matter, please vote because it affects people like myself. Um, now, I'm currently advocating for a lot of senior citizens. We got literally ladies in their 70s serving time that should have been for involuntary manslaughter or something, you know, or people that have pre dementia and can't remember their time when they go to board. So it's like we, we have. Uh, we have to address these people sitting in prison. And I, I just say, please vote, please participate, get involved, 
I don't care how young you are, get involved and, and be compassionate toward the next person. That's it.